remember our brother <clears throat> Jimmy Sanchez. If you've read the, the prayer list and stuff, he, he uh, suffered a heart problem earlier this, this last week. He's in the hospital. He's going to, um, uh, he's got three blockages and he's going to have a bypass on Tuesday. So keep him in prayer. Uh, call Cindy, tell her you love her, you love him. Let them know we're there, whatever they need. Let's, let's make sure that we can help them out with whatever, whatever's going on. Keep him in prayer. Keep everybody in prayer that's on our list. Everybody that's not on the list, people that you know, yourselves, your family. Share with one another that he is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. Praise the Lord. Before I start the sermon, the message this morning, let me say a few more things about the yard sale and then the thing that's going on this Saturday. For the chili rano plates, the deadline will be Wednesday, Wednesday night, so I can take orders up until then. But please phone in your orders or call me and give me an order or let me know here or something uh, today. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll close down the orders on, on Wednesday because we have to prepare for that. Um, I need volunteers. If you want to come and help out, we've got all kinds of things for you to do. They set up and take downs and move arounds and go get this table, that table, whatever, then they move stuff and food and stuff around and just to do all this. And I want, even if you're not coming to just to set up or something, please come and support each other. Come and just fellowship with one another. Talk to each other. Learn about each other. So we can pray. When we pray, we know what we're praying for. We know the specific requests that we can make on behalf of that person. So come and support the yard sale and, uh, the, and the food sale. The breakfast taco is going to be in the morning, so come get some of those. Because if you don't get them, i got to eat them. I love the breakfast tacos. They're very, very good. Very good. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to be talking about the powerful word of God. The powerful word of God. The word of God has supernatural power to change lives. Supernatural power to change lives. And we're going to talk about that through the message this morning. We'll show you some of that. Now, a lot of people are confused about what the Bible teaches, what it really teaches. But here's some humorous answers to a Bible quiz given to middle school students. Here's some humorous answers to those questions. Number one, Noah's wife was Joan of Arc. Number two, Moses went to the top of Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. Number three, the seventh commanded is, thou shalt not admit adultery. Number four, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Number five, the followers of Jesus were called the Ten Decibels. <laughs> Number six, da uh, David killed Goliath, uh, Galahad, I'm sorry, David killed Galahad and was one of the Finkelsteins. I don't even know who the Finkelsteins are. <laughs> Got to be something in the modern culture. And number seven, a Christian should have only one wife. This is called monotony. <laughs> now, the Apostle Paul had preached only three weeks in Thessal uh, Thessalonica before he was run out of town by an angry mob. And remember, we're talking about this. But he left behind a group of believers who formed a church. He wrote them this letter to encourage them in the face of opposition. So let's go to this letter. Let's go to our scripture or passage for today, which is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became the imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they might be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God come upon them at last. Praise the Lord for the scriptures. Praise the Lord. Now, in 2007, now some of you probably remember this. A man named uh, A.J. Jacobs tried an experiment to write a funny book. He, enti- he titled it, The Year of Living Biblically, One of Man's Quest to Follow the Bible as Literally as Possible, or one's man, One Man's Quest. Now, he wasn't a Christian, but he read the Bible in just four weeks. And he wrote down every rule he could find in the Bible. And he tried to obey it. Now, the vast majority of these rules were the kosher rules that were found in Leviticus, which are really hard to keep up with. But, of course, his experiment was flawed. It was flawed from the beginning because he didn't understand that the Bible isn't a book of rules. It's a love letter from God. It's a love letter from God. If you only read it looking for rules, then that's what you'll find. But if you're looking and reading it, searching for God, you'll find him. You'll find him. Now, Jacob's Missed the point of the Bible because the scripture says, the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. We find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But Jacob's experiments reveals what most people think about the Bible. They think of it as an ancient, archaic book of impossible to keep rules. But for those of us who know God and love God, we know that this book is more up to date than tomorrow's newspapers. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our nation is losing its moral compass, its compass because many of our leaders no longer consider the Bible to be a reliable guide for truth, a, a guide, I'm sorry, a reliable guide, guide for truth. But it is a guide for truth. And I agree with the American statesman Daniel Webster. Now, Daniel Webster wrote these things. He said, if we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, Our country will go on prospering. But if we and our posterity neglect its instructions and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury all of our glory in profound obscurity. That's a lot to say we need to reconsider and look at what the truth is. Let's consider three truths about the Bible, about the Word of God this morning. Number one, the Word of God comes through ordinary people. The Word of God comes through ordinary people. 
Now, Paul referred to his preaching to them when he wrote. He said, you accepted it as the word, not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God. In verse 13, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is. Now, Paul had the audacity to say that the gospel of Jesus wasn't just a story from his imagination, but it was the word of God. And we're sitting here reading these words 2,000 years later. And we consider it and know it in our hearts to be the word of God. Amen? Amen. The thing that makes the Bible totally unique is this. Look at what makes the Bible unique. It's written over a period of 1,500 years. It's written by 40 different people and in three different languages. Those languages were Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Now these were ordinary people who were inspired by the extraordinary spirit of God. Now Peter wrote, for the prophecy never had its origin in the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Think about that phrase. Carried along by the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't that be a wonderful place to be? Swept up in the Holy Spirit and just carried along. Ooh. That's amazing. It's uplifting. It's inspiring. Moses was a prince of Egypt. And he was writing in the wilderness. Daniel was a prime minister writing from a palace in Iraq. Paul was a prisoner writing from behind the bars. Amos was a farmer. Peter was a fisherman. Solomon was a king. Luke was a doctor. And Matthew worked for the IRS. God spoke in different ways to different people. He thundered his message to Moses. To Jeremiah, God's word was like fire in his bones. To Elijah, God spoke in a still, small voice. And God spoke to Daniel through dreams and visions. The Bible is written for all people. It is the world's best-selling book. The fact that the Bible was written down by all of these ordinary people convinces me it is truly the Word of God. Now, if I picked 40 people right here in Delview, I picked 40 of you and told you to go sit down separately from each other and write about a controversial subject. Do you think there would be complete agreement in that document? Would there be 40 documents that have a common theme and subject? I seriously doubt it. And these 40 people that I would pick from here are living at the same time in the same language and in living in the same culture. But the Bible is over 1,500 years, 40 different people, different times throughout those time periods, and in different languages and in different cultures. But look how it is. The Bible has a symmetry that can only be described as miraculous. Miraculous. Praise the Lord. God's Word, God's Word is communicated through ordinary people who were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
Now, some people claim the Bible is just a collection of old myths and fables. Others call it the good book, but they don't consider it to be God's book. But for us who have studied it, for us that are Christians, we believe it is the word of God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Number two. Number two about the word of God. The word of God is at work in us. It is work in us. Now, Paul went on to write, the work of God, which is at work in you who believe, which is still part of verse 13 of our text. When you're thirsty, you can drink water, and that water starts to work in you to relieve your thirst. But when you're hungry, you can eat food, and that food starts to work in you and gives you nourishment and strength. And when you breathe in oxygen, the oxygen goes into your lungs, and it works in you to give you energy. And what? Without food, oxygen, and water, we would soon die. But the Word of God is more important. The Word of God is more important. Jesus told Satan, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4. The Bible is like living water that quenches your spiritual thirst. It is like bread that nourishes your soul. It is like life-giving oxygen as God inspires you and me. The Bible says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. In Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. And since this is God's word, we should be careful not to criticize the author. Let me tell you a short example. There was a self-appointed art critic who was visiting an art museum and making snide comments about every one of the paintings. All this and all that. Every one of the paintings making snide comments. She approached one frame and said to the guide, I find this image to be shallow, crude, and lacking in beauty. What is it? The guide said, ma'am, that's a mirror. <laughs> the Bible not only gives us a picture of God, it gives us a picture of ourselves. A picture of ourselves. When you hear and you read and you study and you memorize God's word, you have a good grasp of it then start asking yourself, what is God telling me to do in response to his word? What is he asking me to do? So let me ask you here this question. To what extent is God's word at work in your life? In your life. In your life. Number three, the Word of God produces 
opposition. The Word of God produces opposition. Paul wrote, you suffered from your own people the same things these churches suffered from the Jews. Verse 14 of our text. Paul faced hostility and opposition in every city where he preached. He writes that the Jewish people killed God's prophets and even killed the Son of God, Jesus. When you believe the word of God, you are going to face opposition. Why? Why? There will be opposition because of these three reasons. And each one of these I'm going to give you is another message in itself, all by itself. But we're going to save those for another day. I'm just going to give you these three broad terms. The gospel exposes the ugliness of sin. Number two, the gospel forgives undeserving sinners. Amen. Amen. And number three, the gospel, uh, the gospel predicts punishment for sin. Predicts punishment for sin. Now in 1730... There was a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards, and he was in New England, and he was the president of Princeton, where he died at the age of 55. He said in one of his sermons, he said this, it is nothing but God's hand of mercy that holds you from falling in to the flames and fires of hell every moment of the day. And then he concluded with what he was talking about when he said, and now you have an extraordinary opportunity, a day when Christ has thrown open the doors of mercy and is calling and crying with a loud voice to poor sinners. And their hearts are filled with love to him who has loved them and washed them from their sins in his own blood. The Word of God has supernatural power to change lives. Supernatural power to change lives. In 1949, the Foreign Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention appointed a Texas pastor, a Texas preacher, to serve as a missionary to Columbia. His specific task was to build a seminary in Cali and to train Colombian pastors. He wanted to train them to share the gospel and start churches. However, before he could ever build the seminary, Dr. Hickerson died in a small plane crash over the remote jungles in the mountains between Colombia and Venezuela. Two years later, a delegation of natives from the interior came to the Baptist Mission Station in Barangilla. There, these natives announced to the missionaries that they were followers of Jesus. The missionaries were surprised because they hadn't sent missionaries into these remote areas. Now they ask how the natives heard the gospel. How'd you hear this? The new believers explained that they had found a book. That, they, that came, this book came from heaven. It was a leather-bound New Testament written in Spanish with the name Julius Hickerson engraved on the cover. Only one member of the tribe could read Spanish. So he read that book in se within several villages in that, re that remote area. Everyone in the villages became Christians. And several churches 
had been started, using nothing more than the mold in this book from heaven. Now, Julius Hickerson died on a plane crash before he could build the seminary, but his Bible survived. These Colombians, this, these people read it, and they gave their lives to Christ. That's the life-changing power of the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can we pray?